In July 2010, the largest manhunt in modern British history was launched as police searched desperately for a man who was armed and dangerous. He'd already killed and it was feared that with a grudge against police, it was likely he'd kill again. This is what happens when a man believes that he has absolutely nothing left to lose. This is a case of Raoul Moat. Before I start today's video, I want to thank my sponsor, Ritual. Thank you very much, Ritual. You guys all know that I care about my physical and mental well-being. It's really important to me. It's why I exercise. It's why I look after my diet. And as part of that, I also take multivitamins. Ritual is the obsessively researched multivitamin. And you know, that's why I like it, of course. You know me and my research, it's obsessive. And the great thing about that is that these multivitamins ensure that I receive nine high quality nutrients from D3 to omega-3. And they are difficult to get enough of every day. They really are. And um, particularly if you're like me and you're plant-based. Essentially, Ritual manages to take the guesswork out of figuring out which vitamins I need. I am currently taking the Essential for Women multivitamin and Symbiotic Plus, which is a probiotic blend for my gut. So Ritual is offering all of you 20% off your first month. That's 20% off one month's worth of vitamins or protein by clicking the link in the description and entering the code EMMAK20. But now let's get on with today's video. If you're new to this channel, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency, please get your notifications on, subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Also, if you fancy having a natter, I do live premieres every single week, which means that we can get to know each other and chat about crime and also just about our lives, full stop. The case today I'm covering because you asked for it to be covered. I have a long list. The list is getting longer. But this one I decided to choose, firstly because I feel like a lot has been reported on this, but not necessarily as deeply as it should. I feel that there are forgotten victims in this case. And I also think it's one of those that poses questions for many of us, morally, ethically, and of course, makes us think differently about those who choose to do jobs like in authority, such as the police. Because often we just assume that these individuals are going to their day, home in the evening, and then getting on with their lives without a problem. And of course, police officers sometimes can be put in the most precarious and devastating of situations. And certainly the case that we're gonna to cover today is gonna to indicate and explore that that is the case. Raoul Moat, he was born on the 17th of June, 1973, and he grew up in the Fenham area of Newcastle. Newcastle is the northeast of the UK, and he grew up with his half-brother Angus. Now Angus, when he's been questioned about what it was like growing up, he said that one of the things that really stood out about Moat was that he was a really outgoing, fun-loving person. He was somebody who had a lot of friends, he fitted in really easily. He didn't seem to struggle with relationships. He was an individual who was gregarious, and he said of his brother, he was a friendly, generous soul, a very loyal individual, warm, with a great sense of humour, just a lovely, lovely guy. So that's the sentiments of his brother. But it also seems like there was a troubled side to moat. So it's known that in his youth, he committed animal cruelty and arson as a child. And if we're gonna have the ting ting bells of worry regarding red flags in childhood, animal cruelty and arson are big indicators of antisocial behavior and certainly the indicators that can lead to antisocial personality disorder. Moat and his brother, well, they happen to be raised mostly by their maternal grandmother. And 
they were really poor. But even though they didn't have a lot economically, and with respect, in the 70s, the world didn't feel in the Western world as unequal and out of sync and out of balance as it does today. Probably because we don't look into each other's lives in the past as we do today. The reality is that with social media, you can't help but notice that there are kids called the rich kids of Instagram. You know, where they're traveling around on the private jet wearing brands I've never heard of, but I assume are very expensive and looking like they must have a hairdresser on site all the time because there appears to be no static in their hair. That kind of stuff today means that we have comparisons of the rich and the poor. But certainly when I was growing up in a working class environment, nobody really had very much. So even though Moat and his brother were poor, it wouldn't necessarily have provoked a negative experience as long as they were fed, warm, safe. They're the attributes and variables that are required in childhood, certainly of that era, to mean that you were doing okay. Grandmother apparently was a really stabilizing influence on them, but the thing about this stabilization is that that was very much required because they had a really dysfunctional start. So first of all, he would never know his father, genuinely never know him. His father was called Peter Blake. Peter would actually claim that he'd been completely unaware that Moat's mother was pregnant. That was Josephine Healy. Apparently when they separated, she hadn't informed him of this and she refused to disclose any details whatsoever to Mo about his father. Now that's, in my opinion, quite abusive. I don't think that any parent should feel that they have the right and the power to refuse a child's knowledge about the parent, no matter how dire the reality of that parenting may be. I mean, I genuinely believe that a child should be told even if a parent is a rapist or a murderer because it doesn't define who they are. That's not who they're gonna become. And certainly when you think about just feeling that you have an anchor and knowledge about who you are, where you come from, it's better to know. This is why people who've been adopted and can't find their birth parents and when they have that psychological need to do so, it's so difficult when they don't achieve that opportunity. So withholding this is a power issue. It could also be a shame issue. I appreciate that. But the reality is that for Mo being a boy, that would have been challenging. She also had mental health issues. And on one occasion, she burned all of Moat's toys. That may not have had anything to do with her mental health issues. She may have done that because she wasn't a very nice person. She might have done that because she wanted to punish him. She might have done that because, I don't know, maybe a little bit like Moat, she had a bit of a penchant for setting things on fire. But the point is, it wasn't a healthy environment for her to bring those children up in. So she ends up rejecting him. And this is when Gran takes custody. Ironically, even though Gran now has custody, his mum lived a few doors down with another man. Think about the message that that gives to a child, genuinely. What are you saying to a child if you are literally living a few doors down but you don't really want anything to do with the children and you've moved some guy in and you won't even tell that child who their actual father is? The level of abandonment, the attachment issues would be absolutely full volume, without a doubt. So I think that for Moat, it would be incredibly challenging just living on a street, constantly facing that abandonment. Now, he and his brother were really close when they were growing up, which is understandable because they shared the same experiences. They knew the pain of abandonment. They dealt with the dysfunction together. But it appears that as they start to grow up, as many siblings do, they start to grow apart and Moat becomes really obsessed with bodybuilding and he starts creating new alliances and friendships with other bodybuilders. He then later becomes a bouncer, whereas Angus, his brother, follows a really academic path and he went to university. So there is a chalk and cheese element there, isn't there? But again, very interesting and intriguing to look at how one brother looks at escaping through an academic path building his mental resilience, his academic resilience, and using that as a tool to escape poverty, potentially to escape the 
painful experiences of his past. And then Moat goes and becomes a bouncer and becomes really strong physically. I often think that when people want to build their body to such an extent that they are a competition bodybuilder and then they go into bouncing, you know, at clubs and security, it's not that they're trying to make up for something. I'm not saying that they have insecurities that are dark and that come from a dysfunctional place. I'm saying that there is something about wanting to look that big and to seem that strong to give a message to people around you. And if you have had a fracture in your foundations and you don't want people to imagine that there is pain within you, you don't want people to look at you and think that there is something that you are managing that is deeply distressing within you, by making yourself look big and strong and powerful, it closes down sometimes even people wanting to explore vulnerability within you because you seem so strong. Why would you have anything going on? So arguably it's a bit like putting on a costume, making yourself look a certain way with the hope that people aren't gonna ask too many questions. And also the fact that it's very male, it's a very manly experience. He hadn't had a male role model. So it's his caricature or a stereotype, I suppose, potentially being borne out in that moment by becoming something that he thinks looks so masculine, so male, so unlike the man who rejected and abandoned him, potentially. Another note that I want to make is that bouncers obviously aren't all out there getting involved in violent assaults. Many bouncers do it effectively, they de-escalate, they know how to deal with the public, but there are some bouncers who use it as a license to beat the crap out of strangers. Genuinely, they exist, believe me. My husband and I used to run nights in certain places for music. We have seen that happen. And some take great delight in demonstrating that they are in charge. And if there is a part of your nature that enjoys violence, then this certainly gives you an opportunity and a platform to use it for such means. He doesn't stay as a bouncer, uh, he actually moves on in 2004 and he starts a tree surgery business and he calls it Mr. Trim It. I know we're talking about a serious subject today, but I do think that Mr. Trim It is quite cool. I suppose you could open a other kind of parlour called Mrs. Trim It. Maybe looking after your bikini line. See? Great with branding. Anyway, it does seem that when he starts this Mr. Trimmit business, he's got quite a few issues. And during this time, he does try to get help for it. So apparently he approaches social services, but he didn't get any support through them. So despite this tough exterior, he's asking for help. And I always feel really frustrated when I cover a case where an individual has gone out of their way to actually specifically request support and nothing happens. If an individual has got to the point where they're struggling to the degree where they actually seek intervention, usually that's at a really difficult, precarious point in their life. And if you don't offer them that help, if you don't show them that they have meaning, it can do one of two things. It can disengage them and make them feel absolutely useless and helpless and worthless. Or it can make them really angry. Oh, I asked you for help and you denied me. So neither of those are an efficient way of helping people to manage their mental health. Also, people who knew Moat said that they had real concerns about his mental health. They said that he was paranoid, he was insecure, he was obsessive. Also, he was incredibly sensitive. Now, if we think about the fact that he's been committing arson, hurting animals, but then we add to that the trauma that he's experienced in parenting, and we add to that the general feeling of abandonment and attachment issues that are provoked from his environment with his mother and the rejection from his father, that is a cooking pot of problems because arguably you need secure foundations often to feel that the world around you is a place that you can explore safely. If you don't have that, if you have a deep insecurity, a deep mistrust of your primary caregivers, like a mother and father, one absent, one present who doesn't want you, and they 
make you feel that the foundations that you live on are flawed and broken, then you don't trust anyone. And if you can't trust anyone, you're going to be sensitive because you're going to be constantly looking around to prove that theory, to prove that belief system that people are not to be trusted, that you are alone in this world. And again, that gives way and credence as far as I'm concerned to the reasoning behind him bodybuilding and working as a bouncer. I may be feeling a disaster on the inside emotionally, but I'm perfectly okay on the outside. I'm strong and powerful on the outside. That paradox in that moment. Also, his friends said he really did seem to suffer from depression. They said that Mo had this real desire. His desire is he just wanted to be a family man. He really did. And apparently when he had children, he was really good with his kids. People saw that. When he was self-employed, he did things like made sure that he could arrange his work around their childcare needs. But he always had this undercurrent of paranoia. So one of the things that he held a belief about was that he'd been unfairly persecuted by the police. Now this was, began, they believe, when he was working as a doorman. Bear in mind, definitely had a history of violence at this point. Add steroids to that, used to call it roid rage. Bit of roid rage in the 90s, got a bit of roid rage. Don't get me wrong, some people dispute that. But I'm just going to say, certainly I have seen people who take steroids being very angry. So, whilst some may dispute it, personally I think that they can definitely exacerbate anger. And during his time as a doorman, being involved in some violent escapade, shall we say. He'd also been involved in at least two road rage incidents. Also, allegedly he regularly beat his girlfriend, which is horrific. So we're talking about real criminality here. Bear in mind what we were talking about earlier on about indicators of antisocial personality. This is definitely filling and ticking all the boxes. He was also very jealous and very controlling. He actually got convicted for assaulting a child and that child was one of his own, I believe. Now that's something that he denied, but he served an 18 week prison sentence. He'd actually been arrested in total 12 times in the previous decade. And of those 12 times, he received seven charges, but he'd only actually been convicted once. So, there are a lot of big red flags in this man's life so far. We have some really serious issues in his psyche and they're playing out in ways that are causing him harm. And an 18 week sentence in prison is something to be avoided and the most of us would choose to do that. But it suggests to some degree that there is a propensity for violence. Nothing that has been so grotesque that people are really homing in on him as a big issue or problem or an individual with great potential for harm. But certainly there are indicators that this kind of thing could escalate and wow, when we talk about escalation, this case is talking about a dramatic escalation. That's not to underestimate for one minute the fact that he was violent to his partner, violent to his child, violent to random strangers in his job, clearly. As I said, there's a propensity for violence, but we're going into a whole different ballpark in what happens next. On Thursday, the 1st of July, 2010, this is when he's 37 years of old. He's got three children at this point, and this is the day that he gets released from Durham prison. Now, it had later transpired that Northumbria police were actually warned by prison authorities after the release, that he probably intended to cause serious harm to his partner. They say may, but as far as I'm concerned, if they are that worried that this offender who's been violent is going to cause harm potentially to his partner, I would be having it as a probably, because they are concerned enough about this that they were actually warned. So the police know that this is somebody who has got a potential to do great harm. Now his partner in question was not his partner at the time, it was actually his ex-partner, 22-year-old Samantha Stobbert. 
So what the prison authorities believed was that just before he was released, Samantha had basically told him something that had made him really angry and he was stewing on it. They felt that they thought he had revenge on his mind. And it became quite obvious to them to the degree where they'd notified the police. Now, I just want to throw it out there. I'm not here to blame anyone. That's not necessarily what my job is here. Maybe sometimes. But if I were in a situation where a violent perpetrator were in prison and they were getting out, stewing on something, and I know that they had previous form and had been violent towards a partner and a child, and that they were really angry about this partner, and then somebody actually got in contact with me from the prison services and informed me that this person was being released and had malevolent intention, as an officer of the law or a police constabulary, it's my job to ensure that I protect that potential victim. So I'm going to get in touch with them. Or I'm going to create some kind of protective mechanism around them. They did nothing. Hi, hi, it's the prison authorities. Um, got a bit of a problem. Guy called Moat's getting out. Yeah, Moat. Yeah, yeah, Moat. Big guy. Used to be a bouncer. Loads of offences. Never actually got convicted apart from once, but loads of really violent offences, we know. Big Lloyd head, you know. Yeah, he's really angry about his ex-partner, but I think he still thinks is his partner. She's told him something, and basically he's going to do her some pretty serious harm. You need to know that, because it's, it's bad. It's bad, you need to know that, yeah? So just take that seriously. Okay, thanks. Um, I've, I've, heard, I've heard that now, thanks. Do you want to take some details? Yeah, no, I'm all right, thanks. I'm not saying it went down like that. I wasn't reactment. There wasn't like a reconstruction of the actual moment. But this is crazy. This is so wrong when this kind of stuff happens because the reality is that Samantha is now at risk. So Mo had been in a six year relationship with Samantha before he'd been incarcerated. Bear in mind, she's 22 at this point. She was a kid. No disrespect, but she was genuinely a kid when they got into a relationship. And she would certainly have been dominated by this man. And the power imbalance would be huge. They'd actually had a daughter together. And they'd been together before he was incarcerated, of course. But when he went to prison, Samantha ended the relationship. But he was not ready to move on. It's as simple as that. And he becomes really angry because he realises that Samantha's in a relationship with another guy. So she started to see 29-year-old karate instructor Chris Brown. Chris had actually only been in Newcastle for six months at this point. He'd met Samantha whilst he was essentially canvassing door to door for his kids' karate classes. So he was just going around, knocking on doors, drumming up business, sliding doors moments. If only she hadn't answered that door. You'll understand why when I talk about this further down the line. But it's those moments, an innocent meeting, an excited beginning that ends in something quite the contrary. Because Moat feels so enraged, he enlists the help of his former business partner. This is 26-year-old Carl Ness. Carl Ness is told he needs to spy on Samantha whilst Moat's in prison. So again, when you think about domestic abusers and how they control their victims, he's using Carl Ness to do this. He's essentially got somebody on the outside keeping track of what she's doing. So, of course, as far as Samantha is concerned, she's broken up, she's moved on. She doesn't need to worry about an ex who's inside. I'm sure she had reservations about him getting out. I'm sure she had concerns about what he might do at least she would think he probably wouldn't be happy with her new relationship. But she's with a guy who does karate. He can handle himself, right? Bear that in mind. Samantha probably has this sense of false protection, false confidence, based on the fact that this partner that she's got now is clearly somebody who's very good physically. She doesn't know that Moat is stewing on this to such a degree that he's got one of his friends to actually spy on her. And of course, 
Ness ends up catching her with a new boyfriend and he reports it back to Moat. As I said, Moat and Samantha were not a couple, but he's not accepting that reality and he's beyond a shadow of a doubt unwilling to even consider tolerating the situation. As far as he is concerned now, Chris and Samantha are in his sights. They are the enemy. And bear in mind the fact that we have an individual like Mo who potentially is dealing with antisocial personality disorder and attachment abandonment issues, feeling that he's being left behind, that she's rejecting him. And the rage that ensues within is almost unmanageable as far as he's concerned. And Chris is an innocent man in this. He doesn't have any relationship with Mo. Why on earth would he be considering whether his life was at risk? Now, as I said earlier on, it isn't just his ex and his ex's new partner that he has a grudge with. He's got a real grudge against Northumbria police. He'd felt persecuted basically by the authorities. He claimed he was sent to prison for something he just didn't do. And he said that because he'd been sent to prison, it had meant that he hadn't been able to see his three young children. This is basically since the assault charge had occurred. And he said, as far as he was concerned, the police had manufactured this on purpose. They wanted to slow the investigation down. They wanted to punish him. That makes me instantly believe that he also had a real superiority complex, that he was that important, that the police would seek to cause him further pain by keeping things slowly turning as opposed to speeding them up and making him have the outcome that he needed. The fact that he thinks within his mind that he is an individual of such note that the police would expend their energy in this way. But this is what he's thinking. So again, those paranoid feelings, those potential delusions are really obvious in the way that he's acting in this manner. However, it wasn't that that was the real sticking point for him as far as his grudge with the police was concerned. It was more than that. So when Samantha ended the relationship with him, she obviously anticipated that there could be some trouble from Moat. So the way that she decided to, shall we say, manufacture an ending that was more palatable to her as far as coping, and remember, she was scared of him, for good reason. So because she wants to cope with an ending and feel like she can put a punctuation mark there, full stop there, she says, I'm seeing a police officer. Saying that, is all about self-protection, isn't it? It's about her wanting to let him know, you know, you're in prison now, you've had problems with the authorities, what you don't wanna do is to cause any issues with me because I will then have a police officer because he's my partner immediately dealing with that situation and it will have grave impact for you. So she's doing it, it's a naive, it's a stupid, it's a childish lie to tell but it comes from a place of fear and many of us will understand the motivation behind that. So at this point, Moats found out that Samantha has ended their relationship, but not only that, he believes that Chris Brown is a policeman. And it really, really affects the way that he feels about the world in general. And soon after his release, he actually makes his grievances public so first of all, he posts threats to police and to other people on Facebook. He wrote things like, just get out of jail. I've lost everything, my business, my property. And to top it all off, my last of six years has gone off with the copper that sent me down. Again, it isn't the copper that sent him down, but he's building a picture. When we build pictures of possibility, they can be positive or they can be quite the contrary. But it's fueling that fire. It's fueling that feeling that he has a righteous rage. That's the reasoning behind this kind of belief system that he's creating. CCTV footage had later actually show Mo outside a shop in Newcastle. And when you look at that CCTV footage, basically what I would say is it represents the calm, 
before the storm. There's something so ordinary about it. Yet within Moat at that time is this harbouring of extraordinary rage. We get to Friday the 2nd of July 2010. At this point, no Chris and Samantha, basically just round at Samantha's neighbour's home. This is in Scarfell, Burley and Gateshead. They just stayed there. It was quite late at night and even into the early hours of the next day, they were enjoying themselves. Bear in mind, they have no reason to suspect anything terrible is going to happen. As far as they're concerned, they're falling in love. They're spending time with new friends, they're having fun. This is a really lovely part of any relationship. They had no idea that Moat was coming for them. That always affects me, those kind of moments, you know? When we're sitting there and imagining Samantha and Chris just hanging out with friends, just enjoying themselves, relaxing, just being young and having no idea what is literally coming around the corner for them. On the early hours of Saturday morning on the 3rd of July 2010, Ness, who as I've told you was spying on Samantha anyway, he drives Moat to Samantha's home in Burley. He's in a stolen white transit van. Ness waits in the vehicle and Moat goes and searches for Chris and Samantha. He's armed with a sawn-off shotgun. He's got homemade cartridges. Just for those of you out there who don't know about the UK and the gun laws over here, whilst it's quite easy in the UK to get guns, essentially they're quite easily available on the black market here. I mean the illegal ones. What's quite difficult is to get bullets. It's really difficult to buy bullets. In America, obviously you can get them and it's part of the course, it's part of the constitution, so to speak. It's part of the recognised laws that people have available to them. But in the UK, that isn't the case. So arguably here, you need to be able to source them, or in this case, you need to know what you're doing with them. Mo is armed with a sawn-off shotgun and homemade cartridges. In the UK, it's really difficult to get hold of bullets and even though you can get hold of guns relatively easy, it is difficult to find things to use with them. So ironically, the black market in the UK makes it pretty simple to buy a gun, but getting things that you can shoot from that gun is pretty challenging. But Ness has managed to help him get hold of this weapon and these homemade cartridges for what he was going to use to use it. It doesn't take Moat long at all to establish where his targets were. So... He just waits. He's patient. Just stays outside his neighbour's property for half an hour. And apparently, during this period of time, he could hear Samantha and Chris and he hears them socialising with the host. And he even said that as far as he was concerned, listening, he could hear them laughing and joking about him. No, I don't believe that was true for a minute. But if you're paranoid, if you're suspicious, and then you're watching a scene play out or listening to a scene play out, and you're believing all of these possibilities and potentials, you can build in that bias, oh, they're laughing at me, they're laughing about me. It's highly unlikely that that would be the case. It's likely that he was dealing with a paranoid state of mind. Moat lays in wait. This is until 2.40 a.m. And that's when the couple leave. They only had a short walk to get back to Samantha's door. But it was a journey that they won't complete. Mo approaches them from behind and this is just outside Samantha's house and suddenly Samantha sees him. She shouts, warning Chris. But he doesn't stand a chance. Mo fires two shots into Chris's back and believe me, a sawn-off shotgun, the power, the force that would rip through Chris's body in that moment is impossible to imagine. 
catastrophic injuries doesn't even begin to describe it. He didn't stand a chance. Just falls face down. Samantha's terrified. Of course she is. She absolutely knows that he's coming for her. She runs back in terror into the neighbor's house and she hides inside and she knows that likely her life is in abject danger. But Mo isn't finished with Chris yet. He reloads the shotgun and he fired a third cartridge into the back of Chris's head at point blank range. He literally decimated that innocent man's body. Then he knows what he's come to do. He goes after Samantha. Imagine that. There is this false sense of security when we find ourselves in the home of someone that we know. You know we're escaping a scenario. We believe the moment that we're inside somehow we'll avoid the tragedy that could befall us if we were in our own home. This person surely won't breach the boundaries and come after us, but he did. He didn't care. He went straight after her. She's in the neighbor's front room. He just fires two more shots through the window. He hits Samantha in her arm and in her abdomen. And as I've said, this is a horrific kind of gun to use in these circumstances. You are maiming, you are killing. Samantha was left fighting for her life. She was also left scarred for life. The mother of his daughter. Allegedly, he said that he didn't actually want to kill her. He wanted to really harm her on purpose because he didn't want her to ever feel comfortable in her body again. He didn't want her to wear a swimsuit again. He didn't want other men to enjoy her body, to see her body. How controlling is that? It's demonstrable of how controlling and how territorial and how he saw her as an object that was his and only his. And if he couldn't have it, then no one would enjoy it. By this point, Ness, who'd been waiting in the stolen white transit van, he hears the gunshots. And at this point, he drives away. He just leaves Mo at the scene. From that, we have to decipher, or at least suspect, that Ness didn't believe that Mo was going to do anything so terrible. Maybe he believed that he was going to threaten the couple, just make them scared. Then all of a sudden, he realizes that he's being implicated in something far bigger. Who knows? Either way, Ness is entirely culpable in this moment. You don't take a man who's paranoid, suspicious and rageful to his ex's home and allow him to wait outside with a sawn off shotgun and homemade cartridges. That makes you complicit, end of. The police arrive and because Mo is completely aware that he has to escape now that the van has gone, he manages to flag down a taxi and he escapes. Then the police and the paramedics turn up at the scene. It was described as carnage. Carnage. There's another man involved in this story at this point as well, because Moat needs to escape and he wants to get away from the area. And Ness also needs to flee the area. Although if I was Moat, I'd be a little bit on the angry side with Ness. Don't get me wrong, not defending Moat for a moment. But Ness, driving off, leaving him alone, with a sawn off shotgun at the scene of a crime, not exactly what you meant to do in those circumstances, but they obviously had bigger fish to fry because they both go to the same guy to help them both escape. So this is 23 year old Karam Awan. He was a part time mechanic, he was a doorman, so that's likely how they met. And he actually drove the getaway vehicle and then took the pair to a woodland hideout. So there are people willing to enable these individuals. What they've just done is the most heinous 
crime that can be described. They've executed a man in the street. They've maimed a woman, neither of which had done anything apart from start to fall in love. A murder investigation is immediately launched. There's a manhunt straight away for Moat because they need to bring him to justice. And I'm sure that the police are a little bit concerned at this point because surely it's going to have gone back to the control room and there'll be a conversation in the offices going, you're not going to believe this. A guy called Moat just gone out of control, already murdered one young man, possibly murdered a young woman as well. Moat. Moat. Yeah, moat. M-O-A-T. That's it. Do you know whether he, uh, had he been in prison recently? Been in prison recently? He had. He'd been in prison recently, very recently. He'd been in prison recently and he'd actually apparently got a few issues with his ex. Do you know anything about that? No. I didn't, I didn't get a call off the, uh, off the prison. Specifically saying, be careful because his ex might be in danger. Good, because it'd be terrible if you had and hadn't done anything, thus leading to this. But who am I to make such obvious points? But this now is a scenario where it proves to become the largest manhunt in modern history. So we get 160 armed officers and armed response vehicles when we're looking at this search. So the local police were joined by hundreds of officers from 15 other regional police forces. And the actual cost of that manhunt ended up costing 1.4 million. So they were really intent on bringing this murderer to justice. And later the afternoon after this had been launched, the police start announcing that they're searching for Raoul Moat because he's considered incredibly armed and extremely dangerous. I can remember all of this going on television and people were being warned, do not approach this man. He's armed, he's dangerous, and you are aware that when they're giving you that notice, it's because what they're saying to you is, if you go near him, you're gonna get killed. Simple as that. Then the police start searching evidence in his home. So they go to Moat's house and there are a few really concerning things that they find. So there's a noose in the loft and Moat had also wrote some suicide notes. He'd written to friends, to associates, he'd written to social services and he writes to Sam, Sam, I can't go on without you. I love you so very, very much and I miss you very, very much. Maybe now you'll see just how much. So what he's indicating there is he's sacrificing his own life because he cannot bear to cope without her. And he's also, in doing that, representing how much he adores her. There you go. I love you so much, I've killed myself for you. Now, even though some would say, oh, well, people do feel that way at times, they're so devastated that they are in scenarios where they've lost somebody that they love and they can't bear being without them. Yes. I agree, but the standard experience within suicide notes that are actually meant to involve suicide tend to be about that individual feeling that they are worthless, they are useless, and they bear their soul much more in a, I am a burden, you are better off without me. Whereas this reads more like emotional blackmail with respect. And on top of that, why didn't he kill himself? You know, if he really meant that his life was useless and worthless without her, it had no meaning, why kill her? Does it make sense? Because he's going to eradicate the very reason for living in that moment. So again, I just don't buy into this being authentic. He could have killed himself. He should have. I don't say that lightly. He should have done that before he caused any great harm but there was an ego, there was a malevolence, there was a rage, and he didn't want that soothed. He wanted that satiated. We get to Sunday the 4th of July 2010, it's 12.45. Awan had earlier driven 
moat and nest to the junction of the A1 and A69 near Newcastle. They travelled in Awan's modified black Lexus. Now, despite the fact that at this point Mo is obviously wanted for murder, there is a national search on, he's got no intention of lying low. In fact, he's decided that now he's killed, and that means there are going to be consequences, he's not going to be able to walk away from this, so he may as well carry out more bloodshed. He may as well make use of this time that he's got before he's caught or killed. At the end of the day, he believes that he has the God-given right in this moment to do whatever he wants. So he decides that what he's gonna do is he's gonna attack a police target. Nearby, this unsuspecting 42-year-old father of two, PC, David Rathband, he's on duty in a patrol car. He's unarmed. And as I've talked about many times, those sliding doors moments, all that occurs here is he is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, just 12 minutes earlier from what I'm about to describe, Moat's called 999. He's had this five minute conversation and Moat at this point has identified himself as the Burtley gunman. He said he decided that he was going to wage war on the police. He said he wasn't on the run. In fact, he said quite the contrary, I'm not on the run, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for them, meaning the police. He said he'd be hunting for officers. He also explains that he shot his ex-girlfriend's new partner and said that the reason that he'd done that, in fact, was because he was a police officer. Claimed that his girlfriend had been having an affair with the police officer that he believed was Chris Brown behind his back. Said that if he'd not been in the police, he wouldn't have shot him. This is the gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Moat. Um, what I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done. Right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back. But one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, the Claudia instructor. Right? Now, you, you bastards have been on to me right, for years. He's a hassle this, harassed this. He has just won't leave us alone. I went straight six years ago when I met her. And I've tried my best to have a normal life. And you just won't let up. Well, I went to jail longer than I should have done for something I didn't do, right, which justify that in your own head. Yes. Right? And meanwhile, while I'm doing that for my missus, she's having an affair with one of your officers. And I've had nothing but grief, and I've had a good relationship with her for six years, which is why we've stayed together. And you police have took too much off me over the years. You okay. won't take alone. Now you, now you think you can take your missus. Now, I didn't mean to shoot her like that, right? That okay, was a, okay. Right? They deserved it, right? But she, right, uh, you, you can see from the ballistics, I've been altering those, those carriages, right? That one was only half the powder. It was only meant to get a compensation, because obviously I'm not going to be around in a few days, right? It was meant to just give her a little injury so she could get loads of compensation. Okay. And set yeah. to bed. Now that I found out she's critical, I'm not happy about it. I didn't mean that. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't right, right. Me, I'm quite surprised she is critical. You know? But I didn't mean that. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not coming in a lie. You have hustled me for so many years. Hey, come anywhere near me and I'll kill you. I've got two hostages at the minute, right? Come anywhere near me and I'll kill them as well. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. There's been a lot of nonsense going on behind my back while I've been in jail. She's changed. She's not all changed. And every, every time I spoke to her and tried to be reasonable, she wouldn't let us anywhere near the bed. Right, she right. The house. She wouldn't discuss anything. And she was threatening for one of your officers. Yep, yep. Right? Now, I've had enough. I've had enough. I've, I've, I've jailed the other well. I've came up with different kids. You know what I mean? I've lost everything through you. Right? You just won't leave us alone, right? So, at the end of the day, you killed me. You killed me and him before that trigger was ever pulled. Right. You know what I mean? You're okay. The first, we, you're the we, we, we are trying to help you, yeah. You're yeah, not trying to help us. You're not trying You wanted me to do myself in, and I was going to do it until I found out about him properly and what was going on. And as soon as I found out, I thought, nah, you've had too much from me. You've had too much from me. You'll get your chance to kill us, right? You'll get your chance to kill us. Right. Okay. We, we don't want to do that, we don't want to do that. You don't want to kill myself, but I'm going to give you a chance, because I am going for officers now. So he's saying at this moment in time, the motivation for me killing this man is the fact that he was an officer. Also, he makes it clear that he only ever wanted to harm Samantha a little, so that she can get lots of compensation. Now that doesn't make sense at all, but... That's what he's suggesting. And he also said that he tried to go straight for the last six years, but 
basically blamed the police and said they would never leave me alone. He said that he was not coming in alive and he also said that he had two hostages. You imagine being the person taking that call, right? I mean, there's so much to unpick and unpack. This guy's saying he's got hostages. This guy's admitting to murdering. This guy's admitting to the fact that he's going to murder more. Now, shortly after that call, as I said, Moat Spots, PC David Rathbun's patrol car is parked at a roundabout in East Denton, which is just near Newcastle. Now, PC Rathbund was a really experienced officer, so he knew the intersection, for example, was a prime getaway route for criminals. The Black Lexus. Bear in mind, PC Rathbund has no idea what's going to play out. He's not looking for a Black Lexus, so he's not aware. It circles his car. And then Moat exits the vehicle and he creeps up, goes up to the patrol car, and he levels the shotgun at the window, just fired two shots at the officer's face at point blank range. PC Rathband later stated this. I looked into his eyes. I saw nothing, no emotion. Then I felt this full on pain in my face. I just knew my right eye socket had just exploded and my eye had gone. I mean, PC Rathbone was in fact critically injured. And the truth is that Moat left him for dead. He believed he killed him. And the injuries were so catastrophic, it's surprising that he wasn't killed. So the thing about PC Rathband is he knew that the only potential for him to survive that moment was that he needed to act like he was dead. He wanted Moat to believe that he'd been successful. So he just lies there and waits. When Moat's left, then somehow, even he doesn't know how, he managed to use his radio to summon help. At this point, he gets rushed to Newcastle General. He had life-changing injuries. He'd be left permanently blinded by the attack. And he'd also have to undergo lots of really painful operations, including surgery to remove 200 shotgun pellets that were still lodged in his skull. The authorities don't take much time at all to link the fact that Moat has to be behind PC Rathband's shooting. Moat had also called 999 at this point with another message, said this. And by the way, at this point, you can really feel how this man is enjoying the control, the exertion, the power on other people's lives. He's feeling like somehow in this moment people are having to listen to him and he's proving what he said he's going to do and that's again important this is a man who has laid state to what he desires and he's going through with it he says to the operator are you taking me serious now i'm going to destroy a few lives like you've destroyed mine i tell you now i'm absolutely not going to stop you're going to have to kill me. A lot of people will have watched true crime, Netflix, documentaries, etc. And you will often hear about criminals who don't necessarily want to kill themselves, but want to be killed by a police officer because it kind of takes the doing out of their hands. Because the thing about killing yourself is it's actually really difficult. As much as people believe that suicide is an easy option, it's as far away from an easy option as can be described because we have a natural inclination for survival. Believe me. It's why if you try to drown yourself, unless you've weighed yourself down very heavily, you're going to fight real hard to stay above water. It's just a survival instinct. That's part and parcel of why we have survived all these years. And so often using a police officer to actually pull the trigger on you by threatening them with a weapon and so on and so forth, that is a way that some criminals choose to die. And he's indicating that. He's kind of letting them know, you want me? You're going to have to bring in a body. Now they realise at this point, finally, finally, they realise that he's got this vendetta against Northumbria police. Bear in mind at this point, they also believe that he's got two hostages with him. But turns out, of course, that those hostages... They were just willing accomplices, weren't they? We know that. We know that he's just got two guys who are helping him. 
but it gives him leverage because if the police believe that he is somebody who has innocent bystanders that he's taken, then they are going to be very concerned about using any weapons, for example, because you could hurt a civilian and that would be terrible. So he's quite clever in the way he's manipulating this situation. The police now give a statement to the press because, as I've noted, they need to let the public know, do not go near this guy. And then they start looking for anything that can indicate where Mo is and how they are escaping and so on and so forth. And they do actually later on find the black Lexus. This is abandoned next to an industrial unit on the edge of Rothbert. So they managed to turn up that car. Another side note as to some of Moat's behaviour is that shortly after he carried out the shootings, Ness arranged a meeting with Moat and his friend, Andy McAllister. And Moat does this really weird thing. It gives him this 49 page handwritten letter for the police, basically his innermost thoughts. Now his reasoning behind this was that he wanted the media to hear his side of the story. I mean, just gonna throw it out there. Just gonna throw it out there. I'm not sure there is a side to a story when you've got a murdered and innocent man and very, very gravely injured his partner and really injured a police officer. I'm not sure that your innermost thoughts are going to go very effectively in the media to, shall we say, excuse behaviour. Don't out there. Don't out there. Also, in that 49 page, shall we say, manifesto, apparently he said, look, the public do not need to fear me. I think, I think they do. I think you're exactly the kind of guy that people like me need to fear. You know, the kind of guy that just kills innocent people for no reason. He kind of evidences in this manifesto that the war that he has is with the police. Now, this is ironic because the police are human beings. They are people. There is nothing other than people in that scenario. So you are murdering a father or a daughter or a sister or a brother. These are human beings, but he groups them together. You know, his argument is with authority and anything that represents that authority. And he actually says that he won't stop carrying out this war until he's dead. When the police get this, they obviously realize that they're dealing with a man who is not gonna stop. So they actually set up a two-mile exclusion zone in Rothbury. They tell the residents to stay indoors. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Whenever I hear this, I'm like, the police telling me to stay indoors, you know. Hello, this is the police. Hello? Hello? Stay indoors. Why? There's a man on the rampage. He's murdering people with a shotgun and he's not going to stop until he's killed a lot of police. I need to stay in my home when there might be a guy around here about to harm me. Are you in the police? No, but I don't trust that he knows whether I'm in the police or otherwise. I'm not feeling very comfortable with this suggestion at all. Just stay in, okay? Okay. Hi, is that Premier in? I'd like to book one of your king size rooms. Thank you, I'll be there in 30 minutes. Thank you, bye. That would be me. Just saying, I ain't gonna take any chances. Number one, if I'm driving a car, I can knock him down, which means that I'll be okay. If number two, I stay in my house and he breaks in, I may not be. Just throwing it out there. I'm not a big believer in doing what I'm told in those circumstances. Do not comply, you know what I'm like. Also, they put out a 10,000 pound reward because they wanna capture Mo. So of course, you know, when it comes down to crims, they're very loyal until you throw money into the equation. But they want to bring him to justice on a serious note because this is one of their own now who's also been horribly injured. And this guy is threatening many more. We then get to Monday the 5th of July 2010. Now, Samantha, thank God, is in a stable condition at that moment in time. And she even made a plea to moat from the hospital bed, which must have been galling and grating for her because this guy has killed her lover. But she wants him likely to be safe with respect. She probably understands that there is some kind of decline in his behavior and breakdown within his psyche. And at the same time, she probably believes that she is the emotional compass for him. 
and she wants him to feel that she still cares. Like she says, please give yourself up. If you still loved me and our baby, you would not be doing this. Bear in mind, that should be validated by the suicide note. Apparently, he loves her, can't live without her. So essentially, if he was telling the truth, that would be something that would make him take ownership of that. So again, that's why I don't buy into the whole idea of that particular suicide note. Now, the same day that Sam makes that plea, Moat carries out an armed robbery. This is at a chip shop at Seaton Delaval, which is near Blythe. It's about 10 miles from Newcastle. He steals £100 at gunpoint. So much for, I don't wish any harm. I don't wish any harm to any member of the public, just the police. Maybe some chip shop stuff. Maybe those, they should be a bit worried as well. Anyway, at this point, the chip shop people note that it's him and two men are with him. Apparently, they're assisting him. So these alleged hostages have gone, you know, full Stockholm syndrome and are now completely on the side. So they can see now that Ness and Awan are also involved. And they would actually also help Mo set up camp in Woodland near Rothbury. They helped him get supplies. In fact, I would say what their job was within all of this, which is just reprehensible, unforgivable, and to some degree bizarre, is they constantly helped him to stay one step ahead of the authorities. I don't know whether they had a macabre desire as well to see as much harm come to police officers, whether they genuinely cared for him, I doubt that. Whether they felt that whilst he was free, they too were free. Because when he's implicated, they're to some degree all implicated. But to do this, to not call the police and let them know where he is, when they know that he's at dire risk of harming other people, it's beyond shameful. And they deserve everything that's coming. That's all I'm saying. Because they are complicit. Full stop. Now, police are quick to assume from what they have gathered evidence-wise that it's likely Moat's sleeping rough. And the reason they assume this is, first of all, he's really familiar with the terrain. He went on a lot of camping trips in his 20s. And also, when they are searching the area, because bear in mind they've got this two-mile cordon, so to speak, they start noticing that he's got abandoned campsites and they start finding his property abandoned at these sites. But they're really frustrated. It just always seems to know where they are and where they're going. So he just manages to keep evading them. Now it later transpires as well that Mo had been hiding in gardens and sleeping in spare rooms as well as setting up camps. Can I just have it noted that my phone call to the Premier Inn is thus validated? Amen. On one occasion, he was actually even seen on CCTV walking up High Street in Rothbury. That was the focus point of the search. Again, that isn't outside the realms of ration because of the fact that you're not expecting the guy who's the known and wanted killer to just be trundling up the High Street. It isn't going to be something that you necessarily believe will occur. Maybe because of that, you don't have a bias to look in the way that you would otherwise. Police really went to town on this search. They did, genuinely. They used every resource at their disposal to track him down. It included sniper teams, helicopters, dogs. They had 20 armoured anti-terrorist police vehicles from Northern Ireland. The big guns. RAF tornado jets even flew reconnaissance missions for the search. Huge. Also, they got the army involved. And... They even brought in Tracker Ray Mears. It's like, who else do we need? We've got the helicopters, we've got the jet, we've got the dogs, we've got the army. We've got everything. We've probably got several psychics. They're all saying different things, but they're all in there. I feel like we're missing one thing. One thing that we're missing that will really make a difference. Ray Mears. Anyway, that's what they did. They had almost a tenth 
of the police's national firepower focused on that area. And they did believe that he'd be hiding out either around the small village of Rothbury in Northumbria or in the actual grasslands around it. And essentially they knew that they were going to find him if they kept concentrating on that location. During this investigation, they arrested several people who were accused or suspected of assisting Moat with equipment, information, evading capture, and also they believed that they had helped to select targets. Now, of course, two of those were Ness and Kurum Awan. The police helicopter managed to spot those two. They were in the Rothbury area at the time. Now, when uh, Ness and Awan were arrested, they were like, we are innocent. We are merely the hostages. We are merely hostages. They're taken in, of course, you know, and they're like, we feared for our lives. You can imagine the interrogation, can't you? What happened? You would not believe it. We were just walking around and then this man came from nowhere and he had a gun. And then he said, come with us in my car, the black Lexus. So I just drove and then he just took us places and we just had to go with him. Okay. Was it your Lexus then? It was my Lexus. It was my Lexus. When he got out and shot the police officer, why didn't you leave the scene? Bearing in mind it was your Lexus and he had a gun that he'd removed from the Lexus. Didn't think of that? Okay. Can you therefore describe why you were seen assisting an armed robbery at a chip shop? I was hungry and he said I didn't have a choice. Not going to go down well for these guys, is it? So they basically are saying, you know, we were just innocent victims. We were traumatised. We were just doing what we had to do to survive. But the investigation soon found out, well, you know what? We don't believe you. Why don't you believe me? I'm totally believable. Let's just go through a few things. So you're saying you were a kidnap victim? Yes. You were traumatised and afraid for your life. Indeed. All the time. Why did you leave Ralmote, go and get supplies and then go back to see him when you could just have got an informed authorities. Have you ever heard about Stockholm Syndrome? Yes, that would be Stockholm Syndrome on steroids. So it doesn't wash, obviously. But again, like I said, it's amazing how these individuals are so, I want to use the word narcissistic. I'm not using it in the kind of, they've been classified as narcissists, but just this egotistical side this belief that they can outsmart authorities as if the police have not dealt with individuals like this day in, day out, forever, ad infinitum. And where these two guys are concerned, they actually appeared in court for the first time on the 8th of July 2010. They pleaded not guilty to the various charges against them. They were like, no, we were definitely forced under duress. But the prosecution were like, please let me have this case. This is a great case. We want this case. Because there was so much evidence against them, including letters they had written to their family. Yes. And I don't just mean, dear mum, hope you're okay. Could you buy me some socks for Christmas? Not those kind. Literally, letters evidencing that they were willing participants. I guess they tried to say that Raoul Moat was trying to force them to do that as well. So it's just all there, out in the open. They're not going to get away with it. And in March 2011, there was this five-week trial and they were found guilty. Firstly, of the attempted murder of PC Rathband, also conspiracy to murder and robbery. Ness would also be convicted of Chris Brown's murder and attempted murder. Of Samantha because they had conspired. You know, they'd conspired with Moat before, during and after the shootings. Ness would actually be sentenced to life with a minimum of 40 years to serve. So that's a long period of time. Now I know that the police take murder seriously and I appreciate that some of us don't even believe that you should get to walk free ever if you've been involved in something so heinous as the crime I'm talking about today. But 
the police particularly dislike, understandably, when one of their own is harmed. And we're talking about, first of all, Raumo thought that he had killed Chris Brown, who he believed was a police officer, number one. So they knew that he intended to harm not just one police officer, but then the second that he blinds, thinking that he killed. So they are very, very unhappy with that scenario anyway. And the courts tend to represent that. And Awan, he got life with a minimum of 20 years. So they were both punished heavily and rightfully so. And during that trial, the evidence actually came to light that they had nearly killed another policeman. So they were literally about to murder another person, another officer, but they decided not to because Moat hadn't finished his McFlurry. You know, what's really striking about that sentence that I've just said, because it almost sounds humorous, doesn't it? That a smart is McFlurry or a flake McFlurry or a cream egg McFlurry, depending on the time of year, that literally saved the police officer's life. But what it really represents is how little Moat valued life. How little. That maybe killing the officer was important, but maybe finishing the actual ice cream is more important. It just demonstrates the lack of culpability, responsibility, accountability. It demonstrates the callous disregard for the value, meaning of life. But that's how close someone came to becoming another victim. Now, later in June 2011, 31-year-old Scott Rainsbeck, he'd be jailed for 15 months because what he admitted was that he'd actually moved the stolen van, which had been used by Mo on the night that he'd injured Samantha and killed Chris. He also admitted that he'd hid items from it. So these guys had a lot of people trying to help them. Now, going back to the actual unfolding crime at hand that we're talking about, given that Moat's already killed one man, severely wounded a woman, critically injured a police officer, the authorities genuinely felt that he'd pose a threat to the public. So they had armed guards posted outside schools in Rothbury because that makes sense. If you are an individual who wants to cause the most chaos, destruction, you want to impact most on society, you kill children, you harm the most vulnerable. So we get to Friday the 9th of July 2010, it's 7.25 p.m. Police respond to a sighting of Mo. This is in Riverside area of Rothbury. Major operation gets underway. Armed officers and tactical vehicles, they head to the location. As I've said before, the local residents have all been told to stay indoors. I'm at a premier inn. I'm not staying indoors. This guy's armed and dangerous. I'm getting as far away from here as possible, thank you very much, with my car full of people I know. Anyway, the armed officers, they move in and they surround moat. This is on the banks of the River Coquette. And it was basically the start of a six hour standoff. Now, according to witnesses, Moat was lying on the ground and he had a shotgun pointed under his neck. So clearly he's putting himself in a position of grave harm. And he's in that moment explaining physically, I suppose, his emotional dysregulation and pain, which is, I don't want to be here. I'm going to take my own life. But he's not doing it in that moment. So there must still be some conflict. He hasn't conclusively decided that he's going to kill himself. But he's letting the police know that this is a potential. The police are stationed about 20 feet away. And they tell Moat to drop the weapon. Moat turns to face the police. Then he placed his gun to the temple and he drops to his knees. As I've said, a lot of witnesses said he was just lying on the ground, but this is how the police saw it play out. So now he's letting them know, come any closer, potentially gonna blow my brains out. He's letting them know that yes, he is at risk and he is the perpetrator, but remember an officer's job is to serve and protect, even when it comes down to people who are criminals even when that criminal has seriously wounded and harmed one of their allies, one of their colleagues. They start the negotiations and these commence around 8 p.m. Now, 
During all of the negotiations, Moat would either lie or kneel. So he kind of moves and motions, but he never gets up. Always, he's got his gun to the side of his head or beneath his chin. These are clearly demonstrating to those around him, if they do anything he's unhappy with, he's probably going to harm himself. Now, I will bring in at this point that Moat's family actually later criticised the police quite heavily. They said that the actions of the police during the negotiations were something they found completely inappropriate. They said that they refused several offers to help talk him down. And some of the offers came from people like Moat's brother. That was his brother, Angus, who he grew up with. His father, Peter, and his uncle. And the police stated that the reason that they didn't do this was because Moat hadn't actually seen his brother for eight years. They felt that they had little in common. And they even believed that the psychological weight of seeing or speaking to his brother after this period of time and being found in such a scenario where he had essentially failed, he'd become a murderer, he was being hunted by the police, this could incite him to cause himself harm. It could be the very thing that pushed him over the edge. But I also appreciate that for his brother Angus, he's probably thinking to himself, look, okay, I've not seen him for eight years, but I know this man. We were friends, we were brothers. I grew up with him, I've shared his story. So for Angus, the frustration is gonna be real. Yeah, you guys are strangers, but you're also the very thing that he hates. He's got a rage, a war on the authorities, on the police. So why would he listen to you? You're saying he won't listen to me because of a time lapse between our relationship. So I do fully appreciate Angus's point of view. And to some degree, I think that it was probably an oversight not letting him speak to Raoul. I really do. I think that it could have been that the outcome I'm going to talk about anyway occurs. But I also feel that to some degree for Angus, he would have had some closure. It's really hard when something happens beyond your control and you feel that you might have been able to change the outcome. So arguably, whilst I completely understand why the authorities decided not to allow him that conversation, I also feel realistically that there should have been some kind of bridge that they could have met on. Some kind of, as opposed to compromise, a collaboration maybe one of the negotiators could have been with the brother and so on and so forth and kind of sensed out that situation. Or maybe they could have just asked him, do you want to speak to your brother? And gauge that reaction. They didn't even need to see he was there. But it didn't occur. And like I said, the police very much believed it would aggravate the situation. Also, they didn't let him speak to his father. I'm not surprised on this one though. Seriously, as far as this one is, concerned I get it he'd never actually met him I mean he'd never met this man <laughs> like hi in your worst most dire of scenarios ever let's have a reunion I say reunion I mean since I was the sperm you haven't seen me but here I am welcome home son it's just not gonna go down well is it it's as simple as that so the other thing that the police are very aware is, is that he's got quite a paranoid mental state. And if you're suffering from something like psychosis or paranoia, suspicious thoughts, the last thing you need is some stranger coming in and saying, I'm your dad, because he could question that. He could believe that he was being cheated, that they were twisting reality. And that's a really risky scenario to put into place. I do think that it's easy on reflection to criticize the police. It really is, because you can go, well, what have they got to lose? It's always that. Hindsight is twenty twenty vision, isn't it? But when you think about the fact that just the month earlier, it was literally the month before, there was a taxi driver in the UK called Derek Bird. I actually went to the scene of this crime and did some reporting from it. He killed 12 people and injured 11 others in Cumbria. It was horrific. And so the police are likely thinking that we don't want any more civilians harmed and they didn't want to put anybody at unnecessary risk. Now, in fairness, if the police had allowed family or friends to speak to Mo, and then it actually blown the heads off, 
then have been absolutely criticised beyond belief for putting somebody in harm's way. So I also have some sympathies with the police. There is another perspective though. There always is in mine, isn't there? How many perspectives can we draw in? But there are other perspectives on this and some claim that the police's decision was actually influenced by the fact that one of their own had been shot and critically injured by Moat and that they felt angry with the knowledge that Moat had seemingly waged war against them. And some people would even go as far as to say that this was the police being vengeful towards him, that that's why they acted this way. Now, during the negotiations, witnesses actually heard Moat tell the officers, I've not got a dad. No one cares about me. He also stated, I'm not going back to prison. I'm not going to be on a drain to society. It all ends in this field tonight. So you can feel the juxtaposition there. I mean, he's been caught bang to rights. There's nothing he can do. This is the end of the line for him. And yet on one level, he's saying... I've not even met my dad and he didn't want me. And that's emotional and sad. On another, he's talking about, I'm a waste of space. I'm going to be a drain on society. And they're very emotional. They're very painful. And you can kind of feel that no matter how grotesque his actions, you can feel it. But then it all ends in this field tonight. So that full stop, that's saying this is it. And one could say, well, maybe it means the crime spree, but... I think we can read into it. He's talking about the fact that he won't be leaving that field alive. He also at one point, and this is staggeringly sad, he asked if Chris Brown had been a police officer and he's told no. No, your ex-partner's boyfriend was not a police officer. Apparently Moat became really agitated. He asked to speak to Samantha on several occasions at this point but unfortunately she couldn't, she was still in a really serious condition and they felt it was too risky, of course, because he might threaten her, you know, if there was any way of getting to her, maybe he wanted to finish the job. So police actually used Moat's best friend, Tony Laidler, because one of the things that they wanted to do was ensure that he was fed and that he had drink available to him. So they used him to deliver that. And of course, the whole premise of that was hoping to persuade him to surrender. Now, there is a really bizarre twist in the story. I digress on this one, but I have to throw it in there. I have to throw it in there because it's too weird not to. So in this really bizarre twist, in this case, former England midfielder, Paul Gascoigne, very famous in his day, very famous, cried on the pitch, a lot of news, very famous adored and adorned in his day. He arrived wearing a dressing gown, carrying chicken, lager and a fishing rod. Yes, Paul Gascoigne was at the time, with respect, suffering with addiction issues. He was heavily, shall we say, under the influence of alcohol and cocaine and he had convinced himself that he was Moat's brother. I did not come here for a publicity stunt, right? Okay. Just to let the public know, I'm sitting in the house bored, uh, nothing to do, and I felt sorry for him because he's been a good friend of mine. And then I decided to get him a dressing gown, a jacket, uh, some food, and that, and I st tried to stay in the bed and breakfast up the road because I knew the police were stopping loads of cars. I jumped in the taxi, start, wanted to stay in the bed and breakfast, so I could stay there and then I was going to walk through the mountains because I know all the rivers in Rothbury. I know everywhere in Rothbury. And I was going to walk through the the hills where my ribs even broken with all all my stuff for him and start shouting his name. But I just didn't go and it brought some chicken, some bread. Uh, I know I bought him a can of lager for the taxi driver goes a can of lager to give him. Morty, I've got a message from Morty. I went out looking for him. I've got a Newcastle United jacket for him on top of what I've got for him. And uh, I was going to go through the, the moors on my own in the pitch black and keep shouting his name because I knew he wouldn't shoot me. I know I'm a good friend of him. All I've got to do is walk through all the rivers where he's supposed to be and shout Morty's Gaza. 
I know he did something wrong. Uh, he, he may do his church, but I'll tell you what, good behavior will be out. He's a good, listen, as far as I'm concerned, the guy is a nice guy. Someone's given drugs and it's made him like that. Yeah, I would lay him to talk to me, just me and him, one-on-one -one chat. And if he goes to jail, I will to go to jail and visit him a, few, a couple of times a month. Well, I don't want him to end his life because he's a great bloke. All I want to do is speak to him, and I guarantee, I think I'm the only guy that he will talk to. So in that break from reality, he had decided that he would just go, take the obvious things needed in a negotiation. I don't know. Maybe he had that negotiation 101 book. I don't know. But clearly, there he is. Perfect ingredients list of solving this situation. Everyone knows in a negotiation situation like this, what you need above everything is chicken, lager and a fishing rod. And of course, make sure you're comfortable so your dressing gown's going to be important. There he was. Perfect. Gascoigne. Didn't even bring a football with him. Just saying that would have been more contextual. But he obviously fancied himself in that moment as being able to talk down his brother that wasn't actually his brother. So that's a whole heap of weird, isn't it? With respect to Gadza as well, he was and is quite a sweet guy, albeit quite a damaged guy. And God love him for bringing chicken, etc. They carry on with the negotiations, not with Gaza. It won't be a scenario where I'm going to be like, and then all of a sudden they allowed Paul Gascoigne in and with that chicken and the fishing rod, he managed to reel moat towards him and all was at peace. That's not going to happen. So the negotiations carry on and this is until the morning of Saturday, 10th of July, 2010. Police are really worried at this point. They feel like he's going to take his life and they make a decision to go ahead with what can only be considered a highly controversial move. They decided to use unauthorised weaponry. The very fact that I can say the words unauthorised weaponry and then place it in a situation where they're actually going to use it is going to obviously stand out. It's unauthorised for a reason. They got the Taser X rep. It's basically a regular taser on steroids. So it's a dart that gets deployed from a 12 gauge shotgun. It had a range of 100 feet. That means it goes four times further than a regular taser. Now bear in mind, a normal taser fires 50,000 volt darts and they can themselves incapacitate somebody for like 20 seconds. But this one had the potential to incapacitate someone for longer from a greater distance, so it's perfect. They don't need to get that close. This guy's armed, but they could essentially incapacitate him and mean that he could be succumbed to arrest. But the problem is, hasn't been approved for police. Not at that time. Still had to be tested by the Home Office Scientific Development Branch and also, even if it was approved, 18 hours of mandatory training of the use of a weapon would need to be completed before you were able to use it anywhere, let alone in a standoff with an armed gunman. Just throwing it out there, untrained, haven't used it before, unauthorised, probably better to get the brother in to have a night with Raoul. Anyway, the police, they've only been given that weapon a few hours earlier, so the actual training that they'd had at this point consisted of firing a few practice shots at rubbish sacks. With respect, I appreciate that we all like the idea that if we were given a weapon in such circumstances, somehow, without any training whatsoever, we would just develop the skills required and be a hero, probably to a standing ovation by all those around us. It's not how it works though, is it? It's not how, I have done a few archery sessions I think it should go right in the centre. Nearly kills a member of staff 50 feet away. That's all I'm saying. So at the end of the day, what you think you're going to be good at doesn't always transpire that you are. But in spite of all of this, now I've just said the authorities feel they need it. And they believe that this is the only hope that they've got. It would be the only opportunity to bring in, as far as they were concerned, moat in a state where he was alive. So they decide that the firearms officers 
who are trained in handling shotguns would be able to deploy it. It's something that doesn't really make sense. Firearms officers are unbelievably well trained. I mean, their job is incredibly challenging. You shoot somebody, as a police officer, you're immediately suspended whilst they investigate. That's your job at times, and you might not get to come back to the position that you've worked so hard for, or you'll go through years of stress whilst they investigate whether what you did was correct. It's an oxymoron to some degree being in that position because you're a firearms officer who's probably gonna get into trouble for using your firearm. But they decide that these people are gonna be right to deploy it. Don't get me wrong, when I look at them, I'm a bit like, ah, oh, I don't think I want one. I think, I think I want one of those. I think that that would really make me feel safe walking home. I'm not saying that on occasion, in certain circumstances, meeting somebody who maybe challenges you about something they shouldn't or, I don't know, refuses to turn the music down, might not find themselves a hundred feet away going like, because I shouldn't be allowed those things for that reason, but they do look impressive. We get to 1.12 a.m. This is after six hours. The standoff comes to an abrupt halt. Moat was apparently talking about Samantha. He was saying he just couldn't trust her. Then he moved the shotgun from under his chin towards the right side of his head. His right hand was still on the trigger. Left hand was supporting the barrel. Now, a local resident actually claimed that when he was doing this, when he was using his right hand still on the trigger with his left hand supporting the barrel and clearly looking like he might harm himself, the police officers started to crowd around him because they want to bring him in alive. They think he's going to kill himself. And because of this, they become really concerned and they feel like they've only got one option. They feel like they need to deploy the use of the X-Rep taser. They want to stop him. So they let two rounds be fired. Now, of those two rounds, one missed completely and Moat was only caught with a glancing blow from the other. Now, that did cause him to rock back and cry out, but it was totally ineffectual. And that was the catalyst. Moments later, Moat repositioned the gun at the side of his head and pulled the trigger. The officers that witnessed that later reported that his head rocked violently to the left-hand side and then he just fell into the long grass. They rushed him to Newcastle General Hospital in the ambulance, but he was pronounced dead very shortly after arriving. The autopsy identified that the injury to the right side of Moat's head was consistent with an entry wound from a shotgun cartridge. Plus, the injury to the side of his head was consistent with an exit wound. There was a complex skull fracture, extensive brain injury. The injuries were consistent with a single gunshot wound to the head. Of course, there was an investigation over this. The Independent Police Complaints Commission looked at this case very carefully. First of all, there was speculation that Moat had accidentally shot himself because he'd been tasered by the police. So he'd been holding the gun to his head and then he was tasered. It caused a muscle spasm and that made him pull the trigger. And that would have been ironic, wouldn't it? I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just saying that would literally have been the definition of irony. We're trying to save his life. We've used the taser. We've killed him. But arguably, that doesn't seem to have been the case. The IPCC published its findings in September 2011, and they say it is clear from the evidence that there is no suggestion any discharge from the x rep taser caused Moat to inadvertently pull the trigger. Moat was struck by one of the x rep tasers, but this appears to have been a glancing blow, which would effectively have had little impact. All the evidence shows a further distinct movement to Moat to raise the shotgun to his head before firing, which again, makes sense. If the police had really wanted him dead, I'm sure they could have antagonized him a lot more than they did and potentially have got that result either by making him want to fire the gun, causing him to be shot by an officer or by inciting him to do so by shooting himself. Also the report found that, yeah, okay, the taser x rep 
it hadn't been approved for police use at the time, but the report concluded it didn't need to be, apparently. They said in that report that the police were permitted to use any weapon that they saw fit, provided the use of force was lawful, reasonable and proportionate. So in my head, I'm like, you could use anything <laughs> as long as it's reasonable. Who decides on reasonable? Emma, why have you cut this person's head off with a samurai sword? I'm a police officer. It was reasonable. How is that reasonable? They were coming at me with a bread knife. Therefore, even though it's never been used in the police, it was on the wall. I took it off the wall and I sliced the head off. It's reasonable. It's a reasonable force. Why are you carrying grenades with you? Reasonable force. Reasonable force. I mean, arguing that it was proportionate and reasonable to me sometimes seems a little bit outlandish and suggesting that the police are allowed to use anything whatsoever and that's lawful, again, seems a little bit weird. Just throwing it out there, but that's the law. So in 2013, the government actually decided to scrap the tests on the x rep First of all, they'd always been really controversial. Also, sales had been really poor and the company who developed them had stopped developing them. And the other thing that they found with this particular taser was that it did pose substantial risk of serious injuries, particularly if it hit you in the face or the head. I mean, who knew? Who knew that a taser that was massively more powerful than a normal taser that shot on a dart from 100 feet could maybe injure you badly if it hit you in the face or the head? Anyway, they decided that they wouldn't roll them out to the police officers. The IPCC concluded there was no evidence that any police officers had committed misconduct during the moat standoff. So essentially they came out with a clean bill. There is actually a ripple effect in this case as well. So the taser x shotguns and ammo had actually been given to the police by a man named Peter Boatman. Now at the time, he was the director of the sole UK taser supplier. But because he did what he did, he acted in contravention of the company's import license. So they should only ever have been used by home office evaluators. That's really sad, isn't it? Because Peter Boatman was doing this because he believed he was doing a good thing. He was actually found dead in his garden three months later. And that's because his firm had been stripped of the home office license. And that was because the police investigation had been launched. So Moat, to some degree, killed him as well. And we can't forget PC David Rathband. He was blinded by Mo. He struggled to adapt to his disability. And he worked really hard to try and make it through. He really did. This guy worked so hard. He threw himself into charity work. He set up the Blue Lamp Foundation. And the Blue Lamp Foundation was a charity that was there to provide support to members of the emergency services who'd been injured in the line of duty, which is so important, so important that individuals who risk their lives for us are protected and looked after. And it doesn't happen enough. He also went on to win the emergency services section of the Pride of Britain Awards. But his personal life just went into turmoil. So in November 2011, he announced that he and his wife were separating. It turned out, in fact, that one of the reasons for the separation was he was having an affair with a woman who'd been involved in the 7-7 bombing. That was a woman called Lisa French. And what Lisa said later down the line was they bonded after essentially surviving their respective ordeals, which I'm not excusing adultery, but people do go through horrible traumas. It changes them, it redefines them, and it's isolating. And then you meet somebody who's kind of been there and experienced it and gets it and sees it without you needing to describe it and knows it because it's their lived experience. And it connects you. And I think that is evident in that relationship. Then we get to early 2012 and David spends a few weeks in Australia with his twin brother, Darren. Darren's actually a police officer there. And shortly before he returns to the UK, this is in the first week of February 2012, he tweeted, I lost my sight. 
my job, my marriage, flying back on Monday and we'll say goodbye to my children. And he signed off with the words R.I.P. P.C. Rathband. Soon after, he told his wife, you won't see me again. I love you. On the 29th of February 2012, that's almost 18 months after the shooting, he was found hanged in his home. He took his own life. A man who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, who in all of the circumstances would have just been carrying on in his marriage as a parent, being the loving and loved human he was. His family actually went on to pursue civil claim against the police because they said that there'd been a failure to actually warn PC Rathband about the threat. Bear in mind, Raul Mo had called the police. If he had been warned, he would have kept moving. As far as they were concerned, there was a chain of causation there. It should never have happened. And they had the opportunity to warn him so that could have been prevented. Was it? Just throwing it out there. Just throwing it out there. The same operator who spoke to the prison person and didn't warn Samantha about the fact that her ex, who wanted revenge, was getting out of prison and she was in danger. Maybe it was the same individual. Just saying. Seems to me like a lot of people should have been telling a lot of people a lot of things and it just didn't happen. But also, aside from those victims that I've just talked about, there's another victim. Chris Brown. Chris Brown is often described in this case as the forgotten victim. And I think that it's true, he gets overlooked because of the sensational nature of the Moat case. Can you imagine being part of Chris Brown's family? He was just dating a new partner, just trying to get his karate school up and running trying to live a pro-social life, inspire young people in his community. Imagine being Chris Brown's family and knowing the reason that he was really killed was because Moat believed he was a police officer. That's what Samantha had told him. It was completely untrue. We completely understand why Samantha had said this to Moat. I'm not blaming her in any way, but arguably this sealed his doom. And for Chris Brown's family, essentially, this man very rarely gets any notable recognition. He lost his life that day. He had everything to live for. He should never have crossed paths with that man. I wish he'd never knocked on Samantha's door. Also, I have to say that I feel desperately for Samantha because she has been blamed by a lot of people because of what Moat did. But it's not her fault. At the end of the day, it's Moat's fault. But I understand that it must be really difficult for Chris's family to live with those repercussions. And they asked Samantha not to attend his funeral. I mean, she hasn't even spoken to Chris's family since his death. It doesn't surprise me, it's too painful. She will feel a level of responsibility and culpability and they don't wanna see her or hear her because it's so difficult to allow that connection to remain when so much pain essentially has been caused by it in their perspective. Also, let's be honest, imagine knowing as Chris's family that the police had actually been warned by the prison authorities about the risk that Moat posed. And yet they didn't warn Samantha, they didn't warn Chris. They have to live with that. And I'd be so angry, so angry. Year after the shooting, some people actually left, would you believe, floral tributes for Moat. None were left for his innocent victim, Chris. And Chris's mother still keeps his ashes at the family home and she said, I am still expecting my son to ring me and tell me he's okay, even now. So life for me is just existing. I really, feel the way that she feels in that moment when she says that, I get it. I think it's such a powerful reference and explanation for the way that you feel when somebody is taken traumatically in this way. 
one of the things that I think we can be clear on is that if Mo had been taken alive, he would have been guilty of murder and two counts of attempted murder. Seriously aggravated by the fact that the victim, at least one of them, was a police officer and the fact that he'd only just been released from prison, literally days before. So if we think about how it would have been played out in court, likely been given a whole life tariff. If he'd likely never have spent a day outside of prison again. There would never have been an aim of reintegrating him into society. And I think that's one of the things that he knew. He felt he'd lost everything. He had nothing to live for. He didn't want to live his life out in prison. So he did the one thing that was still within his control. He took his own life. There was a three week inquest into his death at Newcastle Crown Court. That was in September, 2011. And they concluded a verdict of suicide via a gunshot wound to the head. Now, I will say I presume to some degree that Moat was not necessarily in a normal state of mind during the shootings and when he was on the run. I mean, I can't imagine that anyone who did the things that he did was in any normal state of mind. I think he was probably in the midst of some kind of breakdown. And I know that his brother has expressed that they believe he was having a breakdown too. They also believe that he was hooked on steroids, which I guess we could say had some kind of impact on his mental state. Even some of his actions, you could argue, look like they could have been, shall we say, semi-psychotic, as in he was having a break from reality. But one of the things that I will say is that they didn't consider him mentally ill. So when they assessed what they knew about this man, they genuinely didn't believe that he was somebody who suffered from a severe mental illness. That noted about his potential mental state, one of the things that I will acknowledge is that the 2011 inquest concluded that he was not, in fact, mentally ill. Just bringing you all the information. What others think, what potentially was going on, and what the coroner's recorded. Now, in this case, the police received heavy criticism, but the media's behaviour, well, it seemed to pass under the radar. Now, bear in mind, we all know the media love it when a disaster occurs. I mean, I'm sorry, it sounds nasty, doesn't it? But you know what I'm saying. I'm saying that those big corporate organisations who run the media love a bit of disaster. Sensationalism. Big stories to tell. Big stories to sell. The bloodier the better. You know, keeping people scared keeps people in business. But not only did the media in this case succeed absolutely in creating that climate of fear, almost a hysteria with respect occurred when this was all going on. It actually led to a further aggravation within Moat himself. You know, he was a highly volatile individual. Moat was following all of the reports when he was on the run. He was apparently really angered as well. He felt that there was loads of inaccurate reporting. He felt he was massively misrepresented in the press. And so he bought into that belief in that moment that the reason they were doing that was to humiliate him further, that the police were behind this massive vendetta and they wanted to cause him as much humiliation as possible. So he's reading this and it's inflaming his already broken psyche, dangerous psyche. He's inciting more aggression within him. Bear in mind the police had to undertake a massive manhunt whilst there is this fear-filled, hysterical climate that's been created by the media. Imagine how many people were calling them with sightings and every single sighting is going to take people off the street who are looking for him to places where he isn't. And you know how well that will be. It's like, hello, police, I've seen him. What does he look like? He's four foot three, he's ginger, and he's wearing a checked shirt. This guy's like 5'10", he's kind of strawberry blonde, and he's a really big guy. Yes, it's him. That's the kind of thing that happens in these circumstances, and hysteria does nothing to manage these situations in a way that's good for society, the authorities, and even the perpetrator at large in that moment. Now, following Moe's death, they actually uncovered 50 hours of secret recordings. And these were recordings that had all been done in the lead up to the shootings. And this shows, as far as I'm concerned, evidence of a very disturbed, paranoid mind. 
So like he'd use secret microphones to record everything. That included telephone calls to the police, meetings with social workers, even recorded days out with his children. And the recordings also really highlighted this obsession that he had with Northumberland police. He was absolutely 100% convinced they wanted to set him up. On one occasion, Mo actually was given information by the police because they had received intelligence that someone had actually threatened Moat. So a detective had gone ahead and contacted him to warn him about the fact that this person was threatening him. And Moat was so convinced that this was all about taking him down, all about setting him up. So he actually accuses her of lying, of making this up, and says that they're trying to make him be afraid of his enemies and stir up trouble with his enemies and that provoked him into getting a weapon for his protection he said that they were trying to make him snap essentially so you can see can't you the suspicious thoughts the paranoia the obsession this is not what we would expect to see when somebody is in a well-adjusted mental state so i do take a bit of an issue with the fact that they said that he didn't suffer from any kind of mental illness because this is demonstrative of something pretty worrying and disturbing during Moat's, what could only be said as horrific crime spree, he, to some degree, became this really kind of weird fugitive anti-hero Robin Hood type character. So like loads of people took to social media and expressed support. And mainly it was down to the fact that he had a vendetta against the police and some people were completely comfortable with that. They don't like the police. They don't have a good opinion of them. They don't trust the police. And they saw him as this antidote to that authority. But that's worrying because the police force are there to protect us. Don't get me wrong. There are some proper wrong certainly. And sometimes they overstep the mark and sometimes they're bad people, but that's not the majority of them. And personally for me, probably a tragic indictment of society is that there is a Facebook tribute page devoted to him. And that tribute page amassed tens of thousands of followers. What the actual F. Just like start a Facebook page for a guy who's murdered innocent people just do that just do that people will just be like totally understand i mean this guy bit of a robin hood didn't robin hood like look after the poor yeah didn't robin hood like steal from the rich look after the poor didn't really go out of his way to murder people i mean i think he did murder a few people no but i mean the, they were the ones who were trying to murder him just go with them did he did he rob from the rich give to the poor it was about looking after the weakest and most vulnerable in society. Yeah. I don't think he beat women and children, maimed a woman, killed an innocent stranger, and robbed a chippy. Just throwing it out there. I don't know. I'm signing up to his Facebook page. Seriously, it makes me question most people's sanity who are involved in those kind of tributes. This is a killer of an innocent man. He attempted to kill the mother of his child, but apparently is a figure to be hero worshipped. <sighs> Moments like this, I get super frustrated. Now, in a way, what I will say is I think Moat was a tragic character. He'd wanted to be a family man. He wanted to give his kids a childhood that he'd never had. I appreciate that. Don't get me wrong, he is twisted and warped and broken and offensively aggressive. All of those things are true, but that doesn't mean that he didn't have those hopes. His brother Angus actually stated, I think Raoul had a lot of baggage to do with our family. I think he just wanted a stable family, but it's never worked out and he had a breakdown. He came from a fairly dysfunctional background with very little maternal affection there. Perhaps that's the reason why he was so desperate to form a stable family unit himself in adult life when that had gone wrong perhaps it was the straw that broke the camel's back arguably angus that's very compassionate very sympathetic very understanding and there'll certainly be truth in that but you turned out all right mate and you had the same upbringing and you made your different choices 
and that's why your life is good. Now, ultimately, when you think about Mo, his life fell apart. He ended up in prison. He believed he'd lost his family. He believed he had nothing to live for. He had untreated issues without a doubt. He felt depressed, stressed and paranoid. And in that moment, we can say, well, that's a sad state of affairs. But we can't feel sorry for him. We can't feel sorry for this man. He killed people, he ruined people's lives, and by proxy, other people died, even those who he didn't directly affect. Just the ripple effect of his actions ended their lives. He catastrophically caused losses to people who had no bearing on his mind, his affairs, his emotional state. There was nothing that they had done to him. It was just something that he built in his mind. It absolutely blows my mind that anyone can look up to this man, that anyone can admire him, that anyone can conflate his actions with those of mythical heroes like Robin Hood, that anybody would like a Facebook page of this killer. At the end of the day, yes, we can feel sorry for some of his experience, emotionally dysfunction, his family life, all of that is true. But hey, lots of you will have faced problems as he has faced, even worse. And the truth is, when we face problems in life, it's how we choose to deal with them that defines us. Moat chose extreme violence. Because of him, one man was killed. Why? because he was seeing Moat's ex-girlfriend, because he was mistaken for a police officer. Another one was blinded and PC Rathbo's life was destroyed. It eventually ended because of this man's actions. When you think about the impact that Moat had on the British taxpayer, it was 1.4 million pounds. That said, Moat is absolutely not somebody that we have to feel sorry for and is definitely not somebody that should be looked up to and admired. At the end of the day, many people, lots of you in fact, will have faced problems in your life, will have had dysfunction in your childhood, will have had trauma and abuse and horrible problems, but it's how we choose to deal with them that defines us. Moat, he chose extreme violence. And that's why we can have no sympathy or empathy for his actions at all. Because of him, one man was killed for seeing Moat's ex-girlfriend and for being mistaken for a police officer. Another one was blinded. PC Rathbone's life was destroyed due to his actions. Also, the manhunt for Moat, it cost over 1.4 million pounds. That's said, I'm not sure. How many of his Facebook followers are actual contributing taxpayers. I think you got too much time in your hands, what I'm saying, if you join groups like that. Moat was definitely a deeply troubled and dangerous individual. We need to learn from cases like this. And the most important thing that we need to learn from cases like this is that we can't remember the killer. We have to remember the victims. This man is synonymous, he's notorious. So many people remember his name. How many people remember the name Chris Brown? How many people would recognize this victim's face? And the truth is very few. And yet he was the individual who lost most during that crime spree. This case is a long one. It's been a long one, guys. There were a lot of twists and turns. And I'm not gonna lie. When Paul Gascoigne came up with the chicken and the fishing rod, I didn't know whether I'd gone to a different universe and paradigm, but I stuck with it. And I hope that you, first of all, remember the victims of this case, because that's really important to me that we do. Secondly, that like me, you have a level of conflict when you think about how this could have been stopped or changed, the outcomes could have been different, and the things that we can learn from knowing those issues. But finally, I guess what I think really resonates with me and remains with me is 
how do these kind of people grow up in a society full of this rage without people really noticing what's going on until it's too late? It always sticks with me that feeling that is there a way of seeing and knowing and experiencing and realizing and engaging and figuring out more before we get to these ultimate moments where lives are lost and people's lives are changed forever? Let me know your thoughts. Have you learned anything new about this case? Are you surprised that Paul Gascoigne turned up wearing a dressing gown and carrying a chicken? Do you feel that this is the problem, full stop, when we cover true crime cases, that we talk often about the murderers and the rapists and the abusers and we forget the names of those who really matter, which are the victims in these cases? I'd be really interested to know your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have at least picked up something from this case that you didn't know about it before. And if not, just like right below. No, Em, I know all this. Do better next time. Take care. See you soon. Be safe.